clear that I do plan to make progress. Um, I am anticipating like another 10 messages in the chapter before we get into chapter 2. But I never would have guessed that this would be message 14 and we're getting into Genesis 1-1. But there, again, there has been much, um, much that many questions that we bring to the text that the text doesn't try to address. And we felt like it was best to deal with those things before we got into the text so we could hear what's here and not uh, just hear what we want to hear, that, that other, those other people are wrong and we're right or whatever. Uh, we need to hear from this text and we need to be changed and transformed by it. And so that's what we're attempting to do. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Normally I would read the text and I want it to be read, but because of my voice, is there someone who would volunteer to read um, from the ESV because that's what I'm going to teach out of just all of Genesis chapter 1 down to chapter 2 verse 3 and to read it with some care. I don't mean we're all going to be judging you. I just mean to read it slowly and deliberately. Anyone want to volunteer for that? Okay, go ahead, Jared. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together He called seas. And He saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, in fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruits, in which is their tree seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kinds. And God saw that it was good. 
And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the air. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created in His own image, in the image of God, He created Him, male and female, He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to every thing that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ, we would ask that you would um, open a little more of this text to us, make it clear in our minds. Um, these words that we so hurriedly read, we, we want to be uh, changed by um, and challenged, made to think about you and who you are in our place in your world, and so we pray for grace unto that end, that this text of Scripture would begin to do in us what you intend for it to do. Pray it help me as I speak to accomplish that. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, I have four parts, I think, to my message today. And I feel that we need to get right in and working through them, but I also feel the need to give some brief but important, to do some brief but important work introducing things today. So let's just dive right in. Um, it's always helpful to know where I'm going to be taking you, so let me do that briefly. First of all, I do not intend to deal much with the implications of what I'm arguing for today until next time. So if you're asking kind of the so what question, most of that's going to happen next week, and um, next week's going to be pretty weighty because of that. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, I'm pretty certain it's going to, it would slow us down far too much to do that now, and everything would feel pretty disjointed, um, though I think it's tremendously important and necessary uh, that we get to that point. Um, I think that's, in fact, the whole reason that these verses are written by Moses under God's inspiration at all. Uh, something I'll say next time, and I just maybe would say it now too, is that from the very first word, in the very first verse in the Bible, God is arguing for intellectual ground in your thinking. 
and trying to renew your mind and change the way you think about everything. And so it, right from the start, it begins. And um, we need to uh, be on our toes in that respect. Uh, today, though, I want to explain what I believe is the meaning of Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, especially verse 1. We really won't touch verse 2 too much, um, but mainly verse 1. Uh, we don't have to get far into Genesis before we find ourselves in the middle of kind of uh, big interpretive conflict, right? I mean, just about every word at the beginning is uh, uh, ground that is battled over by theologians and interpreters. Um, while we certainly won't be stopping to enter all of these throughout Genesis, these early ones are important, and I've been trying to establish some important matters at the start of our study for some weeks now. Um, the last two times we've, I've taught, um, I've considered ourselves kind of in the text now of Genesis 1. And um, the first verse, we've already spent one week just setting forth the doctrine that God did in fact create out of nothing, or creation ex nihilo. He did it out of nothing. And um, we spent a whole week dealing with that. Uh, then we spent another week considering simply the highly patterned way in which this chapter is laid out with such care and significance being used in the number of times different words are repeated, the numbers 7, 10, and 3 come up again and again, and not in the pattern we might think. If, you know, if, you'd, if I were to tell you that there were patterns there that emphasize certain things, you would say, well, maybe it's like this and it's not. We considered the typical pattern of the days that we generally think, the things that are uh, fit into each day and the telling of each day, and we noticed how many times the various days have those things absent and they're doubled up or even tripled up on other days and why is that and these things all matter and cause us just to you know to put our antennas up and to say I've got to read carefully we can't just skim this thing over and say we got it we need to be careful readers so this week I want to consider the remaining issues that I see in this first verse um, and what are they four things First, I want to argue for my understanding of Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, as being set apart as kind of pre-narrative, a pre-narrative description of conditions before the main flow of the narrative gets underway, kind of setting the stage for the rest of the story. I want to argue for that. Um, I've done it in piecemeal before as we've dealt with other issues, but let's deal with it head on. Then secondly, we'll consider the meaning of heavens in this verse and throughout the chapter. Then we'll consider earth in this verse and throughout the chapter. And then fourth and last, if there's time, and I sure hope there is, we'll consider two other matters in this text, two other words really, beginning and God. And so at that point, we really will have considered everything. We talked about already about creation ex nihilo. Then we'll talk about today, Lord willing, the beginning. We'll talk about God. We'll talk about heavens and earth. And then but the first thing we'll do is talk about where the, how these two verses fit in to the flow of the text. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, okay, so one more thing before we start ahead, and that is just to put my own view out there so as you're hearing things, you're not thinking, where is he going? What's, you know, where, I haven't heard this before or whatever. I, don't, I want you to know where I'm going so that you don't uh, uh, fight me for ground that you don't really want to fight me for. So um, I just want to give you kind of a bit of an interpretive translation of my own of these two verses. Um, in other words, if I were going to rewrite them and try to flesh them out for someone who doesn't understand them, I might write them in this way, hoping that they understood all that was there. And so that's what I'm going to read here real quick. In the beginning of everything outside of God's person, in the beginning of all that we know and the, that we sense and that we can imagine was God's action of creation. He created everything from the highest and everything from the highest and the loftiest unseen spiritual heavens all the way down to the lowest and basest parts of our physical world. The earthly realm, however, this physical realm was from this first instance without form or filling and darkness was over the face of the deep. And in that condition, God's Spirit was brooding over the face of the waters, preparing to do something. And then verse one, chapter 1, verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. 
So that's my understanding of the text. Um, and we're going to then argue for that interpretation. Um, first of all, the argument for understanding Genesis 1, 1 through verse 2 as pre-narrative conditions. The first element of this argument is simply verb tenses and their functions. And that may sound extremely boring and dry, but I promise to be brief. Um, in Hebrew narrative, the verb tense that is generally the backbone of a narrative which moves the story along is a consecutive verb. It's called the vol consecutive or the vol yiktal, right? So whatever, <laughs> but uh, it's there and it always kind of moves. It just indicates sequence. The next thing in the event, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Uh, the verb tense used in verses 1 through 2 are in the perfect. And when this form is used in the beginning of a story, and it's not like this is the only place, but it happens all over the Bible, um, it's almost always to set up the scene and the conditions before the main storyline gets underway. So just for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you all those. If you have questions, I can pull up references and things like that. But just understand that generally this is what's, what's done. You have you know, a few verses of, of the perfect verb tense, and that kind of sets the background, and then you use this volyctal, and you begin to flesh out the narrative. And that's just kind of generally done. And that's what's done here. So it just, it, it fits that way. Um, for instance, verses, what do I mean? Verses 1 through 2 has four clauses the way we translate it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That created is in the perfect tense. And then verse two, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, or the, or the earth, we say was, but really it's, it's perfect tense, to be. The, the earth is in this condition of being without form and void. And then it says, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Well, that was, sorry, uh, that was, is, um, here, Angela, that that verb was there is supplied for, for, for us, we, and, and darkness was over the face of the deep. It's the same verb that's used in the first part of the verse, and we just put it in there again. And then in the third part, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Another uh, you know, instance of a verb here, it's a participle describing ongoing action. It was, this is the, the condition of things. So, you know, the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's something that he did. And then the earth was, it's perfect. It's, it's in the state of being without form and void. And darkness is on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. It's all in this kind of the same perfect tense. Then verse 3 has the first uh, wall consecutive verb. And he said, and that begins the main storyline of the narrative the main sequence that's used in the rest of the text. In fact, every other workday of the six workdays begins with the same verb in the same form. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said six times, moving the narrative along from one thing to the next. <coughs> Each workday begins, let's forget about verses uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 1, 3 for a minute, but all the other workdays all begin with and God said, and they end with, there was evening and there was morning, the whatever day. The beginning and the ending is all marked off of the activities of that day is, and God said, and then it says, there was e evening and there was morning, the second day, the third day, fourth day, whatever. It makes sense that the first day would start the same way, that the narrative would begin in that way too, that you'd have, just like the, the, the verbs already kind of indicate, it would, interpretively, it makes sense to say verses 1 and 2 kind of set the background, and then day 1 begins the same way that all the other days begin. So that when we're talking about the week of God's creation, already when, when day 1 begins already is this earth that is without form and void with darkness over the face of the deep. That's already been created by God. Right in verse 1-1, one, one, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He made these things out of nothing. Now the earth is in this condition. And God's Spirit's over the face of the deep. And creation day one begins. And so, 
Um, again, it would be surprising indeed if the first day began not as the others do, but began before the act of God's speech when God's Spirit was first hovering over the waters for an indefinite period of time. So, anyway, that's, that's the, the way I understand it. Um, the perfect verb in verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth, could, as I said before, when we were talking about creation ex nihilo, did God create out of nothing, could be either a summary of the whole chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, meaning I'm, he's summarizing everything that comes in the rest of the chapter. Or it could be, as I'm arguing, providing background material for the narrative, that initially God created everything, and then we begin with, what, with, with forming what he had made. I argued last time that due to the fact that other Bible authors found in this verse the basis for creation out of nothing, we should not take it as being a summary statement of the chapter. It's not a summary statement that when God started everything, there was already these other things that were there. Other biblical authors look at this text and say, for instance, the author of the Hebrews says, by faith, that is by believing God's word, by faith we understand Right? That the things that have been made were made, or that the world that is was made not from things that, we, that are seen, but from things that are unseen. And it's a reference to this text, and it's telling us that all these things that are made were made from things that are not, that are not able to be seen. Matter from non-matter. And so, anyway, so it's not to be taken as a summary statement. It's rather telling us about what things were like when, as God began what we know as creation week, work day one. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2 are setting the background for us so that we can enter in onto the scene and understand something of what, in our finite ways, of what God was doing on creation week, work day one. Now, that's, I'm going to leave that off now, and uh, there's much more that could be said on that, and I've argued for it more extensively other times, but we're just going to leave it off and, and move on. Um, these verses set, set the background. Now, I want to argument, give an argument for understanding heavens as I do. And how do I understand it? As being, I understand heavens as referring to the, the unseen spiritual realm here in this text. In Genesis 1.1, that it refers to those things which we don't see. Um, so the first argument for understanding heavens in this way referring to this unseen realm in its entirety, is the use of merism. We talked about that before. It's a literary device, a merism, where you, um, you, in order to talk about the whole of something, you pick out something on one end of it and the other end of it, and you just say those two things, and everybody understands you mean everything in between. And the famous one that we, that we can use is from the, the lips of Jesus in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He uses three merisms there, the alpha and the omega. That's the beginning and the end of the, of the Greek alphabet. Then he says, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. Which we all know means he's everything from A to Z. We don't say, well, he's first and he's last, and that's it. He just is claiming there to be the first thing and the last thing. He's claiming to be everything, to be superior and primary to everything that is. And so it's a merism. He can just say the first and the last, and we understand he means everything all throughout. Or we read about the judgment of God coming upon both the great and the small. And so do you say, well, I'm glad I'm mediocre. I mean, no judgment for me. No, we know instinctively that that means whether you're great, I mean, you can't exclude yourself from the judgment of God by being great. Nor can you hope to escape the judgment of God by being insignificant and escape his notice. Everyone will fall under the judgment of God. And so, both the great and the small is a merism to talk about everybody. Especially, and, and you say great and small because people tend to exclude themselves from God's judgment because either they're so great or they're so insignificant. And it says it's neither. Everyone will be judged. Or Psalm 115, verse 13, He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. But well, what about the average Christian? Do they get anything? He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. 
What if you're just an average Christian? Is this promise not for you? Of course it's for you. And you know it's for you instinctively because you understand that use of, of that language, that merism. You may don't call, not call it a merism, but you understand instinctively, I fit, I'm in that group, somewhere between small and great. But it didn't say everyone between small and great. It said both small and great. But you understand it means from the smallest all the way to the greatest, anybody that fears the Lord will receive the blessing of God. And so it is in this case in Genesis 1. The poles are set down on opposite ends of the spectrum. The first pole is set up up in the very highest of heavens, the abode of God as we think of it. That heavenly realm in which unseen created beings take their residence. We're speaking not only of the heavenly unseen realm, but even the highest orders of that realm. You might speak of the everlasting temple of God even, as included in this. And the other pole is set down in this earthly realm before anything here was established or even distinguishable. All of this was created by God. <coughs> now the problem or the challenge to understanding heavens in this way is twofold. And we'll deal with them in turn. First, it means that there are several different meanings of that term in, in the chapter. Right? We're not, we're not consistent in our use of heaven or heavens throughout the chapter. You're going to end... And so it, it seems there's a problem there. We're not consistent. Well, let me say this first of all. I'm really not too concerned with this one, honestly. And the reason is, in fact, regardless of your position on what verse 1 means, you're going to end up with at least two different definitions of heaven by the time you finish Genesis chapter 1. Consider verses 6 through 8. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters, and God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. So according to verse 7, or verse 8, the expanse that divides the sea from the, the moisture that's in the clouds, that is the sky. And the sky is called heaven. That's the heaven. That expanse is heaven. So that's our definition, what we think of as the basic atmosphere, right? Everything from the clouds down to the ground, heaven. Okay, there's waters above the expanse. So we have clouds above the expanse, and that matches what we see in the world. We have heaven, and then there's clouds up above it. And to further fill in that picture, it fits with what we see in verses 20 and following. And God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Right? That's, that's what we're, the same thing. That's the expanse. That's that expanse we're talking about. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. All right. Now, but what, what about verses 14 through 17? And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. What's your problem here? The problem is my expanse is underneath the clouds. And in that expanse are the sun, moon, and stars. Does that fit with what you observe in the world? That you see that the clouds pass behind the sun and behind the moon and behind the stars? No. Now, they didn't understand it that way either. They understood that they're t when we talk about heaven, there's kind of several things we're talking about. We're talking about the heavens above us where the birds fly and we can shoot one down and we can do all those kinds of things. We can catch them in a net. We can do those kinds of things. We can throw a stone up to the heavens. But at the same time, and then above that heavens are where the clouds are. And yet there's also in the heavens somehow that we don't understand before science especially, and we maybe don't even understand now, but somehow up in there, fixed and moving across is the sun and the moon and the stars and they're also in the heavens but it's not the same it's not the same thing but we use the same word and so you have 
the heaven of heavens, and you have things like this. And so, and it's interesting to, to notice also, look at this, uh, in verse 8, it says, God called the expanse heaven, singular. That's the only singular use of the term in this whole chapter. Everywhere else, it's that same expanse that's called heaven is called the expanse of the heavens. I mean, that's what he says. Why doesn't he say in verse 20, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the expanse, or in the heaven, in heaven. Why doesn't he say that? He says, rather, across the expanse of the heavens, plural. And it's, it's kind of jarring. Like, what do you mean, heavens, plural? You just said you made this one expanse, and that expanse was heaven. And then now you tell me the expanse of the heavens. Now it's the, now it's the expanse. A minute ago you called it heaven, singular. Now it's the expanse of the heavens, plural. So now there's all kinds of these heavens, and this is just the expanse that belongs to those heavens. So it's just the text itself is shifty on this word heavens. So you can... Say, so, yeah, I give you, know, you can challenge me and say, well, that's, that's too many, you know, definitions for heavens. I'm going to say, well, you already have a bunch of them. And so let me have a bunch of them. And it's no big deal. Uh, it's, it's not really a concern for me. Um, <coughs> so again, a first heavens like we think of as our atmosphere. Well, the ancients, I'll just say this, had also this understanding of a multiple heavens. Um, at a first heavens, like we think of it, as our atmosphere. A second heavens, where the stars and the sun and moon appear. And a third heavens, which is an invisible realm of spiritual powers, angels, and demons, and God are all in this realm. And you might say, well, where are you getting that? Well, I mean, it's, it's clear. It's right there in Scripture. I'll just... If, you don't, if you're not familiar with it, you can turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, to hear Paul mention explicitly this third heaven, right? He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. So there is a third heaven. Paul says, I've been there. Now, he's, when he says, I don't know whether I was in the body or not, I take that to be probably it was a vision, but it was so real. Like he's, and, it, and he had a bodily experience there. It's like he's not quite sure whether he was in a body or not. He hesitates to say that he was, but he couldn't hardly deny that he was because of the way it, it's, it appeared and it, and it felt in his experience. And so he just, I don't know, only God knows. You know, because it's like if you were to ask Paul to describe it, he would describe it as, well, I touched this and I did that. And you'd say, well, it's not physical. And he'd say, look, I don't know how else to explain it. God knows whether this was in the body or not. And I can't even, it's not even lawful for me to say these things. To, to describe it to you. Now, I'm saying here that all three of these heavens are found in Genesis 1. They're just all there. And it's not surprising that they should be there. I'm just saying that they are there. <coughs> the second challenge here is it would mean that the plural form of the word is used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 when referring to a singular thing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm saying at that point, all that was made was the unseen spiritual realm. There weren't really all these kinds of heavens yet, necessarily. So that's a bit of a challenge, too. The heavens and the earth. And you're saying it's just the one heaven. But consider first, I'll say this, we don't exactly know how to classify the unseen heavenly realm. We do know that elsewhere in Scripture, for instance, Paul, again and again in Ephesians, when he talks about this unseen heavenly realm, he says the heavenly places, plural. He always uses the plural. So I'm going to throw back on him and say, I'm going to follow my inspired interpreters and say that there's plural somehow. And I'm not going to be able to explain it, and I don't have to explain it. I just can say, thus says the Lord through Paul that this is plural. 
so I don't have to explain it. But I, I can, at the same time, say a few more things. Um, the phrase, expanse of the heavens, as I already said, you know, God created heaven, singular, in verse 8, and then later he talks about that expanse of the heavens. And so he's already using it plural um, there to refer to, um, you've got the heavens where the sun, moon, and stars are, and you've got the waters that are above the heavens, and you've got heaven, and he says this is the expanse of the heavens. It just sounds like there's a lot of things going on there. There's more than just one heaven that Paul has in mind. Um, and then just three other texts to look at, just to kind of flesh this out a little bit. Genesis 22 and verse 17 I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. All right, there you have heaven. It's the stars of heaven. That heaven itself has these stars, okay? Then if I turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 14, see something else. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. There you have that phrase, heaven and heaven of heavens. So a, there's at least more than one heaven just from that text. And both and, all, both and all, all that's included there belongs to God. Or how about in Job? This is the last text we'll look at on this. In Job chapter 15 and verse 15, I always want to be careful when you turn to Job and build doctrine, right? Because Job's counselors were rebuked. So if you're looking at their counselors, be careful what you, what you swallow. But they do say a lot of right things. And all I'm, all I'm looking at on this text, um, though I think it can be used for more, is just to show that ancient people thought this way. That's all I'm saying. This guy t talked this way. Job understood it. They understood what they were saying. Job 15, 15. Behold, God puts no trust in His holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in His sight. How much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. So there, heavens is described as, it's the same place where God's holy ones are, where the angels are. Angels are in the heavens. That's not where the stars are, and that's not where the birds fly. So there's at least a third heavens as they understand it. So there's that. Um, heaven is a term, in my understanding, that seems to refer to that which is above. And by implication to this third heavens, beyond us, in a superior sense, a place we cannot reach to, a place we cannot go, we cannot fathom what's there. It's beyond us, it's unknown. This heaven of heavens, where God dwells. The book of Hebrews speaks of the earthly tabernacle that was built, being a copy of the heavenly one. Where is that? I mean, is that on Jupiter? No, it's not. If you're thinking, you know, what, behind what star or what planet is this heavenly tabernacle, you've missed it. It's another realm. It's a spiritual realm. It's something entirely different. There's a heavenly reality that is beyond our comprehension. Ephesians speaks of these heavenly realms, these heavenly places in which Christ ascended and in which He is seated. It's also a place, in, if you're a Christian, in which you have been seated by virtue of your new birth and being resurrected spiritually from death to a new spiritual life with power, the same power that was at work in, in Christ when God raised Him up from the dead and seated Him far above all rule and principality and power, far above every name that is named in this age and the age to come, that power is at work in you and Paul says, you have already now been seated with Christ in those heavenly places. Which is why you can say no to sin when the tempter comes. It's quite a thing. So there is this unseen heavenly realm, and it's simply described many times as heavens, or the heaven of heavens, or the third heaven. So that's how I understand heaven in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Now this argument for understanding earth as I do. 
um, would just be everything else. <laughs> everything else. Which we're not used to thinking of because we think particularly uh, of the Earth as being the third planet in our solar system from the sun and it's just a small part of this physical realm. But that's not often the way the ancients thought. They thought of an earthly realm which contained some heavens in it and a heavenly realm which was beyond it all. And um, again, I understand earth here in verse 1 to refer to the entire earthly realm, the physical world, everything that has mass and matter and existence, that we, anything we can touch and see is from this earthly realm. <coughs> and let me argue for that here. First of all, from the text, you'll notice, and I'll, I'll point it out to you in a minute, but everything that is made in the Genesis account in these days of creation all comes from what is initially called earth in the account. Whatever Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 calls earth, everything that's made later comes from that. And that's remarkable. Notice, look what he says. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So here's the picture. And we can't help but think of it this way. You've got this fear of earth, right? Because that's just how we think of it. But just whatever. I mean, it's there. You've got this. You've got, it's, there's no form. It's empty. Just darkness is over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God comes on those waters. And what happens? And God said, let there be light. So God speaks light into that darkness. And the light was good. And God separated light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the only thing that happened so far into this earth that was dark is God spoke light upon it and then divided light from dark and he calls one day and one night. Evening and morning, the first day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of those waters. So he divides those waters that are the earth, divides them up, and that expanse between the waters above and below, that is the sky. And then what happens? Then the waters below, he clears those out and you get the land. Then in the expanse, he puts the stars and the sun and the moon. And then in, and then in the waters that are below, he creates the, all the sea creatures. And then in the expanse, to fly across the expanse, he creates the birds. And then on the, right, he's got the plants too when he makes the land. And then on the land, he makes livestock and beasts of the field, and he makes things that crawl around that you don't want to step on. He makes all those things. And then he makes man to rule over all of it. There. And all of that's earth. It's this earthly realm. And so the heavenly realm is this unseen realm. The earthly realm is all that we interact with and, and, and experience. Everything you encounter in your life is part of the earth, according to Genesis 1, 1, the way it's describing it. Now, it also later uses earth differently. I mean, if, if this is what's on the face of the earth and this is what earth is, later that same word earth is used for the dry land, the dry earth. So... The words are used in different ways throughout the, throughout the text, but context dictates to us the definition of a word, not just whatever we want to say it means and we don't force it into everywhere it's used. We don't fix, pick a definition and then insist that it means that every time. We rather take our cues from the text. And so the, the word itself means different things as you go through there. But the earth here in verse 1 and verse 2 is simply a reference to everything that has matter. I mean, the sun is, part, is fixed inside this thing that was the earth. That was, you know, it's made up from all these things that were there. The expanse exists from the waters above and below. It's in there. And that's where the sun is. And we would say, well, no, the sun's out there. That's part of the heavens. Well, not according to Genesis 1. The first part of Genesis 1. It is, the sun is in the heavens according to Genesis 1, 14 through 19, but not according to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. That's a different heavens. And so, anyway, so that's one, that's an argument there. Then also, um, you who were here will remember when we went through Colossians, how in that text, the way Paul writes, the earthly realm in that book had to do with anything in the earth at all. 
any philosophy of man, any use of physical disciplines or methods to achieve results in the spiritual realm were all futile because they did not partake of heavenly power, which is only available to men in a positive sense through Christ. And so all these efforts and philosophies and ideas that men have to, to get right with God or to gain God's favor, and somehow maybe you're already a Christian, but you're going to kind of go that extra mile so that God's really you know, pleased with you, all that's futile and useless and it doesn't help you conquer sin in any way because it's all earthbound. And we need heavenly resources. And so you have here the same kind of sense in which you have heavenly things which is beyond the earth and that everything else is earthly. Um, it helps to remember that some of those earthly things Paul's talking about had to do with angels. They had to do with things in the unseen realm, but they just weren't from the heaven of heavens. They weren't from God Himself, and therefore they weren't sufficient. They were from below. They were dealing with the problem of sin as though you were a natural man. Now then, okay, I've gotten that far. Let me just explain briefly these other two words I want to deal with at the text. In the beginning. Beginning of what? <laughs> beginning of what? It's not the beginning of God. Right? So what? the beginning of what? I mean, God's already said, we already read that verse from, or at least alluded to it from uh, the lips of Christ, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning. He, he's, he's before everything. He says, I'm the beginning. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. How about Psalm chapter 90 and verse 2? I'll read two texts here from the Psalms. <coughs> Psalms chapter 90 and verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you were God. So God is from everlasting from everlasting to everlasting, before any of these things were, were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you're God. Psalm 93 and verse 2. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. So it's not the beginning of God. God doesn't have a beginning. We're all very familiar with that doctrinal truth, but it's good just to see it in the text. So it's the beginning of what then? The beginning of our story. It's the beginning of all that we know. It's the beginning of everything you interact with other than God Himself. Anything but God, this is where it starts. Right here. The, everything from the heavens to the earth, this is it. It starts right here. God created it. Everything owes its existence to God's will and to God's command. In the beginning. Right? And John can say, in the beginning was the Word. You get, you get all the way to the beginning that was talked about here, the beginning of everything, and already was Christ. He are, he's already on the scene. You say, well, show me what happened before this and before that and before this, and you get to Christ and you say, well, show me before. There's nothing. That, you already got to the beginning and already was Christ, and there's no going past that. In the beginning was. And here, in the beginning, God created there's only there's only one who can react there's only one who can re can act on anything there's only one who can do anything it's god in the beginning god you say well what else well nothing god created everything from the heavens to the earth he created it all in the beginning god made it all now this last thing this word for god elohim um in one sense, there's not a lot to say about it. It's used in the Bible to refer to God all the time, but not every time. It refers to rulers, to judges, to gods, to angels. And sometimes it's even used as a superlative for something really great. You had a mighty struggle. You had an Elohim struggle. It's like, what are you talking about? That's a weird way to talk. So getting kind of down to the root of things, it's hard to know exactly how the word comes across, but it's helpful to say this, that to just to say that it is a word used for other rulers and judges and other gods and angels and this kind of thing, which doesn't shed, doesn't put doubt on, well, who was it that created that stuff? 
what it means is, it's more like saying, in the beginning, the ruler, the singular ruler, the only one, the real ruler, the, the great judge, the actual being, he's the one who made everything. The fact that you use those terms in lesser ways to refer to other people who do kind of godlike things doesn't take away from his godhood and his uniqueness. It actually further elevates it. In other words, when you have, maybe you have this great, this tremendous, when you have a struggle and it's just a regular struggle, it's hard, it's difficult, but when you have one that nearly costs you your life, you said this was like a godlike struggle. Yeah. That doesn't diminish God. It's trying to say, I was outside of myself. It was too much for me. I'm surprised I lived. Or when you, when you talk, you, you know, you, they find some angels and they describe them with the same term, Elohim. That doesn't take away from the uniqueness of God. It rather speaks to his otherness. That he's so unlike everything we experience in our day-to-day -day life. And our regular, you know, we pick up, we deal with physical things all the time. And you deal with this being and it's like, it's like there's some other kind of thing. It was an Elohim. <laughs> or some man sets himself up as a great ruler and he's in charge of tens of thousands of people and everyone's scared of this person. Or maybe everyone loves this person because they're a great ruler. Either way, nobody goes to make war against this guy because he has great power and he's called an Elohim. Yeah. That doesn't diminish from what God is. I mean, you have all the way through history. I mean, it's, men call other men like it's, it's as though he were a god. What do you mean? You mean he was actually God? Well, no, I don't mean that. I mean, it's hard to describe. It's just, I just said that as kind of a catch-all phrase to refer to how much greater he was than everybody else he was around and everyone else I've ever met. He was godlike. He possessed men's hearts as though he was a god. Or he led that army without fear as though he were a god. And this kind of thing happens. It's, it's in the language. We use it today not so much because... I mean, it's more of an atheistic culture, but you go back a hundred years, you'll find devout Christians talking about other men in this way. And they don't mean any disrespect for God, just the way people talk. And so this phrase, Elohim, used for God, it's used all the time for God, but it's actually, it's, it's kind of, the fact that it's used for other people is kind of, kind of highlights God's uniqueness, actually. It shows that, and in one way, it goes a long way to explain what we mean about the image of God, that there are God-like things in, in, in man. The fact that you can describe a man at all in any way as being like God, that men naturally talk that way about other men, really says a lot about how, how pervasive the image of God in mankind is, even fallen men. And yet it also shows the uniqueness of God. It's likes. To, to call God Elohim is like saying he's king of kings or he's lord of lords. He's chief of chiefs. He's Elohim of Elohim. He is Elohim. And Elohim is the one who made all this. Well, that's all I have. Um, again, not much by way of implications. A lot of those things we'll, just, we'll talk about next time. Um, just wanted to kind of get through, particularly this first verse especially, and explain that. And uh, hopefully that's a lot more clear to you. Maybe if you've not heard some of these things or you've not thought of them before, um, you'll carry them with you as you uh, go on in your reading. Are there questions or comments anybody has just offhand? Yeah, Jared? Can you read your paraphrase again? Yeah, sure can. <coughs> in the beginning of everything outside of God's person, in the beginning of all that we know and sense and imagine was God's action of creation. He created everything from the highest and loftiest unseen spiritual heavens to the lowest and basest parts of our physical world. The earthly realm, however, this physical realm was from this first instance without form or filling and darkness was over the face of the deep. And in that condition, God's spirit was brooding over the face of the waters.